I think now is a good time to get started. Um, so yeah, so once again, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for spending your Thursday evening with us. We'll be talking about the college admissions process as a student athlete, getting into the ins and outs of the application process, scholarships, athletic and merit-based, financial aid, and really anything that anyone has questions about as well. Uh, we'll start off just by introducing ourselves. My name is Mike. I'm a senior recruiting analyst here at Sports Recruits, meaning that I'm working with any student athletes and their families who are looking for additional support in the recruiting process, whether that be looking into uh, communication with college coaches, video support. And I actually previously working before working at Sports Recruits, actually was an admissions counselor for a few years. So I also have looked over college essays and help people with their applications and things of that nature. So happy to address any questions that do come into the Q&A and chat box as we progress through tonight's meeting. And I'll hand it over to Kayla to introduce herself now. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Kayla. I'm a customer success specialist here at Sports Recruits. Um, so I'm kind of help managing the help desk. So if you have any questions about the platform, you'll probably receive an email from me at some point. Um, so that's kind of my um here position here at sports recruits but i'm just super excited to be here tonight with mike to just go over the different resources that we have for you guys especially throughout the college recruiting process so yeah clearly a very important topic we're happy to have kayla on here as she's you know probably started was applying to schools a little bit more recently than i was here so we'll definitely lean on her to kind of talk about that process a little bit more uh, but in terms of our agenda we'll first we'll first talk about what you can be doing before applying to school we understand that there's going to be some people in here that may not necessarily be at the start of their senior year just yet. So we could talk about some things that could just could set you up in a position to succeed. So when you are a senior, you feel that you're fully ready to go. Uh, then Kayla's going to take us through the college application as a whole, the different types of applications, the types of responses you can receive, requirements as part of that. So that's going to be really helpful for those of you who may not have done your research on that just yet. Uh, from there, I'm going to take over and we're going to talk about scholarships, what is available now, and some of you may have noticed that there actually is some pending changes going on, particularly with Division One NCAA sports, so we'll touch base on that a little bit, we'll talk about a webinar we're doing next week regarding that topic, uh, and then before we get to Q&A, we'll just do a quick review of financial aid and some things that are available there, how you can get started, when you should get started if you haven't already, so really excited to bring all this information to all of you because obviously for any school that is really interested in you as being a prospective student athlete, you still need to be accepted to the school to officially end up attending there. Um, yeah, so without further ado, if anyone does have questions, feel free to utilize that Q&A box. We'll do our best to keep an eye on it as we're going through. Um, we'll also save some time at the end. And also for any, this typically does come up. If anyone is looking for a recording of this webinar, you will automatically receive this recording at some point tomorrow. Um, but we'll send that via email. So even if someone wasn't able to attend live, it's something they'll get access to at some point tomorrow. Um, but yeah, so Kayla, why don't you start off and just take us through the, you know, what, what athletes can do before applying to a school? Yeah, no, of course. So um, definitely one of the first and most important things that you guys want to be looking at. Um, a lot of you are probably sophomores, juniors, and some seniors at this point um, that are on here tonight. So again, one of the most important things is getting on the coach's radar as soon as possible. So meaning filling out the recruiting questionnaires that these different colleges have available to you, whether that's messaging the coach directly and then sending you a link to the recruiting questionnaire or going to their website and finding it yourself. You want to be making sure that you're filling out that information because what's that what is what that is going to do? It's going to put your information in their database, meaning that you'll get notified when different prospect camps are happening, clinics are happening, you know, if there's open house opportunities or if there's different facility updates as well um, for that specific college, you'll be in their database to receive those notifications. So that's just something that's really important to do that early so you can be in the know of what's going on there. Additionally, uh, for those of you who might be interested in competing at the Division I or the Division II level, you are required to register for an NCAA eligibility number. So what this is, I, I think, Mike, you can it's around $100 to sign up to receive this number. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. For, um, for U.S. citizens, I believe it's 100. It's a little bit more if you're an international student athlete. Exactly. Yeah, great. So I'm um, around anywhere between 100, like Mike said, 100, 120 dollars, um, you know, you're, you can sign up and it will essentially pay that you can pay that fee and you'll receive this number. Um, and this will allow you to be able to register with the NCAA if you end up competing at this level. And I believe, Mike, if you want to add anything in here, but um, I believe once 
you are once you do receive your number, it's going to ask you to insert some course information to make sure you're academically eligible um, to when you get up to the division one or division two level to compete at that level. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. So essentially, it's just going to be more of a, you know, a confirmation that you are going to be academic, academically eligible at the time that you are a college freshman. There's core courses that are needed to be completed when you're competing at the D1 or D2 level. A lot of that information is available on the website, and you'll see that we actually put in the chat box um, a, 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 an article from our content center that'll give you some additional info, including a link that takes you right to the eligibility center. So be on the lookout for that if anyone is interested in signing up for that sometime soon. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and like I said, too, you know, if, if you're looking to play at the Division three level, you know, the NIA, NAIA or the JUCO level, like this is something that you will not need to complete. But just for those of you who are interested and have the, the desire to play at the Division one or Division two level, this is something that you're going to have to do um, soon. So um, next, you want to do some research and find out what exams are required um, for your different target schools applications. And we'll, you know, dive a little bit deeper into this topic as we move out through our presentation tonight. Um, but just so you guys are aware, like we always like to recommend just doing that research because there are some schools that do do still require um, an SAT or an AC, ACT score, although most schools now are kind of leaning into that test optional um, portion of the application. But again, we'll kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive on that later as we move through here. Um, I think one of the most important things for from my perspective, um, and I think Mike, you can probably touch on a little bit this too, as like your experience as a a, a counselor too, um, admissions counselor, is visiting the schools that are on your list. Um, whether that's going to an admissions event, right, like an open house, or you know, an accepted students day, or even athletics events, or touring the campus with a, your prospective coach, potentially. Um, I think this is so important because you're not going to know if you like a school or not until you're physically on that campus and you're interacting with different people on the team. You're interacting with coaches. You're interacting with maybe professors or seeing the dining hall, seeing the dorms, right? Like you're not going to be able to picture yourself at a school until you're physically there. And from my personal experience, I graduated you know, almost two years ago now, um, that's what made her break. Like, that's what kind of solidified my decision to go to Mount Aloysius College and play soccer there was being on campus. Um, and honestly, like there's campuses I stepped on that I really didn't like, and that helped me kind of narrow down my search. So we just really are advocates here at Sports Recruits to getting on campus as soon as possible so you can make the best decision for you when, you know, finding a college for you. And obviously, too, getting your sports recruits profile filled out with the most updated information. This includes athletic information and academic information, because when colleges are looking, you know, on sports recruits and they're looking for different roster needs, they may come across your profile. And we just want to make sure that you guys have as much accurate information and up to date information on there as possible. So if a college coach comes across your profile and really likes what they see, they can reach out to you and maybe open up a conversation with you. Yeah. And to, to kind of expand on to that, too, typically when you get to junior year, the end of your junior year, sometimes a college coach will even ask to see your transcripts and they might even be able to give you an idea of if you would be a student that is accepted or if you're a surefire accepted student, they might be able to give you a general idea of what type of merit based or academic scholarships that are available to you. We've heard this um, listed as a pre-read. We've heard this identified as a likely letter. So there's a couple of different ways that you can sometimes even get that confirmation before you officially apply to the school. So getting this work done early is definitely a great way just to set yourself up for success and just have a better expectation of the type of academic requirements that are needed at the schools that you're looking into. Yeah, for sure. All right, so now we'll kind of just get into the college application process in general. And I think it'd be really helpful to first start out with the different types of applications that you uh, guys may come across over the next couple months as you're, you know, applying to colleges or for juniors as you're starting to look at colleges. Um, so the two most common applications that everyone's going to see is either an individual application or probably the common application. So an individual application is essentially meaning when you go to the school's website, they're going to have an apply now button, and it will just be a individual application for that specific school. So for example, I went to a small division three school, Mount Aloysius, they had an individual application, and this is really common in smaller schools. Um, but again, you can just go onto their website and you can find it and apply through there. Now, 
um, the common application is probably going to be something that a lot of you are going to be using, especially since this is more of a centralized application system. And I believe that there's like six, six to 800 schools that use the common app. Um, so a lot of schools use this as a way to centralize the application process, meaning that you will be able to fill out all of your personal information, you know, your name, your parents information in one place, and then you'll be able to send that application to multiple schools. Now, I think it's important to note that there might be different things that you need to and supplemental materials that you need to apply. Um, and add to your application in the Common App, right? Like they might ask for a different essay or they might ask for, you know, letters of recommendation. So that's something to be mindful of when you're building out your list of target schools and using, you know, a centralized application system such as the Common App, um, just making sure you're, you know, looking for some of that additional information that these schools might require. And then um, there's also the universal application. So this is more, focused for like bigger schools and for more like Ivy League based schools, schools like Cornell, Harvard, Princeton. So if you do have aspirations of attending um, a more academically competitive school, this is kind of the application that you would be looking into to use. Um, similar to the Common App, it's centralized. So you'd be able to put in all of your personal information and then be able to apply to several schools from there. And then there's also shared applications, which are more um, driven by location and found in particular states. Uh, so for example, example, the SUNY application is for the state universities of New York. So using the SUNY application, you'd be able to apply to any state's school in New York and same with Texas, apply Texas. Awesome. Uh, Kayla, you cut out there for a second. So I'm just going to kind of just relay what, what I think you were saying is more so about those shared applications where typically certain states will have an application that allows you to fill out multiple, uh, fill out applications for multiple schools in one in one shared place. So SUNY is a state university of New York, apply Texas as it's, in, as it's intended, will be a lot of Texas schools, typically state schools in there. So ultimately, as you start to build out your target list and as you start identifying the different schools that you could potentially apply to, Go on their website, see what is available. If you're someone who's really comfortable with the Common App, it's probably going to be easiest for you to have all of that done in the same place. But you know, definitely make sure that you are looking ahead before filling out the application to see what your options are, especially as you get into that fall of senior year. Yeah, for sure. All right. So kind of moving into the different required materials um, as you're looking at these different college applications. So the first things first is obviously completing that application fully. Um, so making sure you're, you know, doing all of the filling out all of the fields um, and then moving into, you know, all schools are going to require official transcripts as well. So they are going to ask you to kind of provide from your high school just a record of the courses that you completed. So then by the time you walk on as a freshman, you are fully academically eligible to be a full time freshman come the fall. Um, so I know we talked about this earlier, but the SAT and ACT exams um, at this point, um, most schools do not require them. but I personally think, and I think Mike can attest to this as well, it's 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 helpful to just do it and have it in your back pocket um, because most schools are test optional. It gives you that option to, you know, decide if you want to put it on your application or not, right? Like if you're a really good test taker, it might be something that you might want to include if you if you do well on it. Or if you say you get a 12, 1250 on, you know, on your exam and you want to uh, Put it on one application but not another it just gives you that opportunity to have that flexibility to be able to you know put it on your application if you would like um something that every college is going to require is also a college essay and i think this is all this personally and and mike you know as your experience as an admissions counselor you can maybe like speak to this as well um this is probably the most important piece of your application because this is where you're going to be able to express your individuality as a um, you know, prospective candidate for for this for a university. So this will give you the opportunity to not only showcase your writing skills, but to also just elaborate on everything that's based on your general information, right? So you're going to be able to maybe elaborate on an experience that might set you apart from the other candidates, whether that's, you know, talking about someone who's made a really big impact on you, or maybe a time that you've overcame adversity, or maybe relating athletics to your college essay. I think this is just a really great place for you to take the time to showcase yourself as an individual and, and how you can 
be of a greater contribution to the school and how you can make the school a better place like when you get there um especially since these admissions counselors right like mike you can probably again talk to this like they're looking at hundreds of applications all the time and this is the this is the time where you can really stand out yeah particularly the essay ended up being a really important piece of you know my time as an admissions counselor particularly when someone was kind of right on the edge of either receiving a certain merits merit scholarship or if they were on the edge of being an accepted student or a waitlisted student that could sometimes be the tiebreaker for you in a lot of ways so if you are able to write about something that does make you unique that does make you interesting that does make you someone that ultimately makes the counselor want you to be a part of that college at some point down the road. That is something that could kind of be that extra step that gets you over the line in some way. So as someone with that experience, I completely back what, what Kayla was mentioning there for sure. Yeah, no, of course. So really take the time to, you know, do your research. Don't rush these essays, right? Like I remember going through it and seeing some of my friends procrastinate because they just didn't want to write an essay. And like, I get it. Like we've all been there. No one likes to just write an essay, but I just think like this is something you should get a head start on, especially if you're a senior. Um, just taking the time doing a bunch of drafts, drafts, having your English teachers look over it or having someone you trust look over it because you do want to make sure that you're putting your best work forward, just like Mike was saying, because it could be kind of that deal breaker for your application. Um, additionally, we have some supplemental materials that you want to keep in mind as you're moving through the application process. These materials could be required or you could just maybe include them on your own if you feel it would be a supplement to your application. Um, so some of these may be recommendation letters. So these can be from, you know, teachers that you're close with and teachers, again, that can speak on behalf of your work ethic. Um, again, this could help you just be set apart from the pack and really kind of hone in on your individual skills that maybe your application can't speak for, you know, just by the information that you're submitting, right? So getting that outside perspective could be really beneficial to your application as well. Also including any certificates or awards or accolades, whether those they may be academically or athletically. This is just another way to kind of, again, continue to emphasize your individuality and just continue to emphasize, you know, other reasons why you should be accepted into the college. Um, additional writing samples and supplemental essays, they kind of go hand in hand, kind of like we mentioned earlier, just being on the lookout and seeing if different schools require um, a supplemental essay, they might just ask you, you know, a different prompt um, that might be different from the common app. So just being aware of that, um, but also community service hours and, you know, talking about that. And I know, I know, Mike, you had a really great experience um, from your previous school with community yeah. service. So I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yeah, for sure. So the school that I worked for, one of the additional supplemental pieces that you can include in the essay was a community service essay that would sometimes lead to a, to an award in terms of scholarship money that, that student athletes, or not even student athletes, just anyone who's applying to the school could ultimately receive. At that time, you would write an essay. It really is kind of open, open in terms of how you can go about it. You can talk about how many hours you're required to do, what organization you work with, and that community service essay could lead you to receiving an additional $1,000 to $5,000 of scholarship money each year that you're at the school. So there were some people who were super involved and it was it, obviously it's great to be a part and working with your community just for that exact reason, but make sure that you are talking about those experiences if there is some sort of community service award that is available. Because, you know, in my experience, I saw people who were able to have $20,000 less that they needed to pay for when it came to their college tuition. So without a doubt, obviously, if it's something that you are getting involved in, it's great that you're doing that just as a, as a human. But hey, if it can make things a little bit cheaper for you on the other side of things, I think it's a great thing to include for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And especially like from my experience, like my, my school was very um, driven in community service. So they really like to see that their applicants were bringing some of those um, values to the table, right? Because they want to bring in well-rounded individuals to their college. So I think that this just is something that you should always just keep in the back of your mind, not only just for being a good human, like Mike said, but also it could, again, turn into something by making your tuition cheaper as well. So yeah. And the one thing I'll add on to here that we haven't noted that that isn't on the presentation now, typically there will be an application fee for a majority of the schools that you're applying to as well. Sometimes you may receive a waiver. There might be ways to end up getting that discounted or not have to pay for it. But more often than not, there is going to be some sort of application fee included when you are reaching, when you are going to figure out your application with these schools. So just another thing to keep in mind that just wasn't on the, uh, on the title screen here, just as a, a fair warning. 
Yeah, no, that's definitely a good call out because especially for those of you who might be applying to, you know, several schools, it can get costly sometimes. So if you do have the opportunity, especially for speaking with coaches, um, I know sometimes they have a great, you know, you know, influence on if your application fee gets waived. So definitely like making sure you're, again, getting on their radar, having some of those conversations early before you start the application process. Um, so I, like we said all night, um, kind of diving into deeper here into the standardized test testing options. Um, so some schools may be test free um, when you're applying to them, meaning, and, and this is very, the, less than 100 schools offer this as an option. So this, you know, is slim to none, but um, this, is where testing would not be considered in your application. So meaning the application would be test blind. So your test scores essentially wouldn't, um, you know, it get you accepted into the school, but it also wouldn't hold you back from being accepted. It just wouldn't be considered at all. Um, and then obviously test optional. Um, this is gonna be the most common option that you're gonna see on applications, meaning that test scores are absolutely not required, but you know they will be considered um, if you do submit them. Um, and not submitting your scores shouldn't submit your application, but like we kind of said earlier, if you are a good test taker or if you wanna submit them, go ahead, it, 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 might, it might help you. Um, I also think too, a lot of schools do this thing called super scoring and give you the opportunity to do that. So if you take the SAT or ACT, um, one to two times or maybe more than once, um, it will, schools will take your highest reading score and your highest math score, so, you know, from both times you've taken them and combine them to make sure you're getting the maximum, the, you know, the most score or the highest score, I should say, sorry, um, on your application. So that's something to keep in mind too. Um, you don't just have to take the SAT once, you can take it several times and, and put your best foot forward that way as well. Um, and then the last option is test flexible. Um, I, I don't think a lot of schools do this, Mike. I, I, I just feel like I haven't really heard this as much. Um, but this is where some type of test score will be required, but you can choose which one to submit. So whether that's the SAT or the ACT, but you could maybe also submit like your AP exam scores or IB exam scores. But again, just really emphasizing that test optional is going to be the type of um, standardized testing option that you're going to be seeing on these applications. Awesome. Yeah, so then we're just going to move into application deadlines. So always, always, always apply early. Again, like kind of like we've been saying this whole time, doing your research and getting started early will just help you um, with the entire process. Um, and there's different deadlines to just keep in mind as you're looking at different applications. So early action, meaning meaning that you're just going to have an earlier deadline to have your application submitted by, but it will also usually lead to you getting a quicker response. This is usually going to happen and be submitted by the beginning of November. There's also early decision one and early decision two. Um, this is a legal binding um, contract. So if you apply to a school early decision, you are legally, you know, bound to go and, ex and attend that university if you are accepted. So usually people apply early decision if they're like heart is set on going to one school like if your heart is set on going to Penn State and you don't want to go anywhere else then you should apply early decision because if you do get accepted then you will automatically have to attend that university and usually these deadlines are around the beginning of November and yep. mid-November awesome um and then most most schools um you know have a rolling admissions process, meaning that there's no set deadline. So students are accepted until um, programs have been filled. I know for my school, um, it was a very you know competitive nursing program. So a lot of uh, students who wanted to be in the nursing program were encouraged to apply early just so they could get their spot as soon as possible. So uh, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, but usually with rolling admissions, the sooner you apply, the sooner you get a response. So that's something to always consider as well. And then obviously there's regular decision, which will usually be due around January or February, and students will receive a decision by April. So then it will give you time to make a decision before May 1st. Yeah. And the only thing I'll add onto this slide as well is when you are applying early, keep in mind merit-based scholarships are typically, typically is a pool of money that is typically going to go to the people who apply earlier. So if you are someone who waits until later towards that application deadline, there just might not be as much merit scholarship money available to you at that point in time. So if you want to maximize the amount of money that you potentially will be receiving from the school directly, that's also a great way to try and make sure that you are, again, maximizing that opportunity more than anything else. Yeah. 
So, um, and obviously just some different responses that you guys might be re receiving from your college applications, obviously accepted, right? Congratulations. You did it. You, you got into the school, which is obviously something that you obviously want to receive. Um, then you have your early decision acceptance. So again, this is the binding contract that we were just talking about, meaning if you do get accepted early decision, you are legally bound to attend that university. Again, early action is not binding. Um, and then Mike, I don't know if you kind of want to talk about the differences between waitlisted and, and being deferred as well. Yeah, for sure. So waitlisting is when your application is going to be put on hold. And it's not necessarily a situation where you changing anything about your application or sending updated scores is going to make any difference in if that turns into an acceptance or not. It's ultimately a situation where they want to see in terms of the acceptances that have been sent out, they want to see how many of those people have decided to go to that school by submitting their tuition deposit. So it's more so to see how much room is available in that particular program or just in the school overall. Where a deferment, what happens is that sometimes will mean that they haven't made a decision on your acceptance yet, and they may request certain info like, hey, when you get to mid-year, make sure you send us those new test scores or, or those new transcripts. Or, hey, we see that you got a, a 1050 on the SAT. If you can get that to an 1150, that's significantly going to increase your chances of being accepted by us. So that's really the biggest difference is that if you receive a wait list, there's probably not much you can do to make a change. It's really going to be up to the school and the people who are applying or submitting that tuition deposit. Where a deferred acceptance, a, a deferred acceptance or a deferred response is really going to be more so about, you know, there is something that you can potentially do, whether it be adding a reference, adding a writing sample, or adding something specifically of your academics that's going to help your case at the end of the day. Yeah, no, for sure. All right. Thank you so much for that, Kayla. It's a ton of information, but I think it's really important for everyone to know this, especially as they're potentially expecting to fill out those applications for the first time in the next month or two here. So scholarships is obviously a major piece in terms of people typically want to talk about when they're going through the college admissions process. So we'll go over some of the more popular ones that people typically will receive. Uh, we've referred to merit scholarships a couple of times throughout tonight's presentation already, but that's ultimately going to be based on your academics. Um, it's going to be based on your skills, your ability, how you're doing in a certain area. If you're applying to a, you know, more of like a science focused type of major, having higher biology grades or having higher chemistry, chemistry grades may lead to you getting additional grant money from that particular school. So sometimes the most common merit scholarship is typically when you receive your acceptance letter, you're going to receive some sort of additional tuition kind of taken off of that. But there are other ways to also receive additional aid from that school doesn't even necessarily have to be academics all the time. We talked about community service. We talked about skill-based. There's also going to be different ways that you can, you know, kind of put yourself out there. There might be an additional essay that you can write. There might be a certain program that you are applying to. So there's a number of ways that you can potentially bring down that overall tuition price. Um, in terms of external scholarships or grants, that's going to be something that isn't coming directly from the college that you are attending. And there's a couple of really great websites that give you the opportunity to potentially see what's out there. There's hundreds of millions of dollars that go unclaimed each year, particularly on these two sites, FastWeb and Niche.com. Essentially, how it works is you go onto FastWeb, you create a profile, you put in a bunch of information about yourself, and they are going to send you a list of different scholarships that you could potentially apply for. Some are as simple as just filling out a five-minute survey, and that could potentially put you in the running to receive some additional money. Others will have, you know, writing samples, the ones that will have a little bit of like a higher, um, you know, like a higher amount of what you can potentially receive will be a little bit more of like a vetting process and interviews and things of that nature. But for those who aren't aware of this, we highly, highly recommend seeing what's out there because at the end of the day, if it's not being used by other people, you might as well put your put your name in the ring to see if that's something that could bring down that tuition price. And while we're on that topic, too, I think it's always really important to note, especially as college prices continue to just skyrocket and get bigger and bigger, we understand that sometimes people will see what we call that sticker price, and it automatically makes you decide that that's not going to be a place that you target. Keep in mind that that sticker price, it is very, very rare for someone who, to end up actually paying that overall exact amount, whether it be scholarships like this, or we're going to get into the financial aid or need-based aid side of things. Usually, that's not going to be an accurate representation of what you're going to be responsible for at the end of the day. So just wanted to make a call out on that because I think it is important where you may see that there's a certain amount of money that you're going to need to go to a certain school, but it doesn't necessarily always you know, uh, filter out that way. Um, as we get into the athletic scholarship side of things, keep in mind, you can only receive athletic scholarships at the D1 and D2 level within the NCAA. NJCAA and NAI schools also do offer athletic scholarships. For those of you who are 
interested in getting interest from Division three programs within the NCAA, you would not receive any aid specifically for athletics. Coaches might be able to work with you and make recommendations on you know, a variety of ways on how you might be able to earn additional aid, but they would, not, they would never receive a scholarship at the D3 level that would say, this is because he is a football player or a basketball player or whatever sport it might be. Um, presently, as it stands right now, particularly for this year, there's essentially two different routes that you can go in terms of receiving scholarships as a student athlete, at least from like an athletic aid perspective. There's a headcount sport and there's an equivalency sport. A headcount sport is when there's a maximum number of players who can receive scholarships, and typically that is going to be either a full ride scholarship or not receiving a scholarship at all. So you see on the bottom left hand side of the screen here, Division One football, Division One basketball on both uh, on both genders, tennis, gymnastics, and volleyball. Currently, if someone is receiving a scholarship, that is going to be something that they're receiving for their full tuition at that point in time. Uh, in terms of equivalency sports, that is when essentially how it works is there's going to be a number of scholarships that are available, but that is more often than not going to be partial scholarships that are broken up across. So the easiest example to explain is baseball players. There's typically going to be 25, 30 or so athletes on the team, but they have 11.7 scholarships that they're able to divvy up across their roster. So not everyone may receive an, uh, some form of aid, but more often than not, you're going to see 25%, 50 percent uh, scholarships that are going to end up matching that 11.7 total amount. Um, in terms of the reason why we said this is current right now, some of you may have been following that there are some major changes going on at the NCAA, particularly at the Division I level. Um, what we've heard and what we are tracking on our end is that there are going to be some major shifts, particularly starting at the start of the 2025 fall season, so basically a year from now. What was going to be happening is rather than having these scholarship limit, uh, these uh, scholarship limits where again, like 11.7 scholarships for baseball, for example, we are going to be shifting to uh, colleges being controlled on the amount of uh, amount of athletes they can have on a specific roster, and it's going to be up to each individual school to determine how many of those athletes receive a scholarship. So if they're if the limit for the, the roster limit for a baseball team, just to stick with that example, is 30 or 32 players. That means if a coach or an athletic department decides that they want to invest a ton of resources in the baseball, all 32 players potentially could receive some form of scholarship, maybe even a full ride. Is that likely? Probably not. But this at least gives more of an opportunity to have more athletic-based scholarships available at certain schools. Uh, Kayla put in our chat box here an article that we wrote about this topic, and we also are going to be doing more of a deep dive in a webinar next week. Uh, talking about this pending settlement and how it is going to affect the scholarships that are available to student athletes. So even if you can't attend it live, we highly recommend that you register for it because we'll send you the recording after the fact as well. So again, what you're looking at on screen right now is currently present for the 2024 season. But if you're in the grad year 2025 or younger, you're most likely going to be going into this new world of roster limits rather than these scholarship limits and the different types of headcount and equivalency sports that are available. Um, and, and last up here, before we get into some of our other information and, the, and some of the questions that piled in here, we'll talk about the financial aid piece. So the biggest difference between financial aid and scholarships is that financial aid is something that you can submit to receive need-based aid. Uh, there's a couple of different ways you can receive that. The most common way to at least get that process started is by filling out what is known as a FAFSA form. Uh, that is the free application for federal student aid. You can, you can uh, file a FAFSA form for as many schools as you'd like. Uh, there's no limit in how many you can include on that list. So if for any school that you were even potentially considering uh, applying to, we highly recommend that you fill out that FAFSA form and send it over to that particular school so they can give you a general idea of how much they, uh, how much you would be potentially responsible for including. Uh, to receive an FSA ID and to get that information out there, go right on the FAFSA website, you create the ID, you most likely, for those of you who are going to have your parents assisting in the payment of college tuition, if you are going to be, you know, being uh, defined as a dependent, uh, your parent would have to have their own additional ID as well. You can see enough, the different information that would be required to receive that FSA ID. This is the first year that the FAFSA form opened up, even before applications opened up. So starting July 1st earlier this year was when you can start potentially getting that information and, and submitting all of your paperwork to those different colleges. So if you haven't done it already and, you're our, and you are someone who feels pretty confident on what schools you're going to apply to, make sure to get that FAFSA form filled out. A lot of people will say, hey, we most likely aren't going to qualify. Really nothing to lose in that sense, right? We still recommend any person who is, even if there's a 1% chance that you might receive some sort of need-based aid, we highly recommend taking a look at that. And also, if you're not sure and you want to kind of test it out beforehand before kind of going out of your way and submitting it, 
a lot of schools, when you go into the financial aid portion of their website, there will be a net price calculator that essentially gives you an opportunity to submit your information and they can give you a ballpark idea of what type of aid you might be able to receive. If you are in advanced discussions with schools, similar to how we talked about that pre-read and likely letter from the academic side of things, if you are someone that potentially has received an offer uh, before you get the senior year, before you can apply, sometimes they are able to do a financial pre-read with you and give you a general idea of what that expectation is going to look like. So FAFSA is easier than ever before to fill out. So we highly, highly recommend to, ch uh, to check that out whenever you have a chance. Um, and we'll make sure to include some additional information and some links where you can, if you wanted to start that process tonight, you'll be able to do so very easily through the website that they have. Um, so that's everything we wanted to go through here tonight, everyone. Thank you so much for giving us a chance to go through a lot of this information. Um, and I know there were a few questions that did populate as we were discussing. So let's see what we have here. And obviously, if anyone continues to have questions, feel free to continue firing those in. So let's see. Okay. So let's see. So I guess while we're also going through these also, Kayla, so you mentioned that you didn't you didn't have that decision of where you wanted to go until you actually had a chance to see your school for the first time. Yes. Was that a uh, visit that you were invited by the coaching staff? Was that something that you did personally with your family? Walk us through kind of like that thought process of, hey, this I think this is going to be the school I want to spend my next four years at. How did that work? Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, I was invited by the coaching staff to come and have like a personal visit with um, the coaching staff and with my parents as well. So both of my parents were with me when I went on a tour of campus with the coaches. Um, I think for me, what really like set apart Mount Aloysius from the other schools I was looking at was they made it. I wasn't with other athletes. I was just with myself the coaches and my family. So they made it really individualized and it made me feel really like unique and special. Um, so that was really great. Um, but they also just really made it about um, because I went, it was division three. So they really emphasized the balance between being a student athlete and playing at the division three level, but also succeeding in the classroom, especially at a smaller college. And I just love that the resources that they had available, um, it was just really nice to be able to ask a lot of questions, to be able to get into the different buildings, um, to do those types of things um, and just see it hands on. And I, I think I went there once I visited and then I came back um, for a, a prospect clinic awesome. and that kind of really solidified. So I would recommend even to not even just getting on campus once, but getting on campus more than once to really just be like, OK, I really liked it. And now I even like it even more to really help solidify that decision for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. And so I think that just kind of even goes in more so into your point where you can't really make a decision on a school until you actually have had the opportunity to see it for yourself, walk around and really have that honest conversation with yourself. Is this a place that I could potentially see myself at? We One of the things that we utilize and apologize, apologies if it sounds a bit corny, but it's something that we call the broken leg test. And essentially what we're saying there is you go to a school, obviously we understand that playing a sport is going to be a significant reason for that, but if you were to break your leg and you were no longer be able to compete athletically, would you still be happy at the school that you're attending? That's yeah. typically a really great way to look at it because at the end of the day, if you're not happy walking around or if it's the off season, if that's the only reason you're going to a school, more often than not, it's not going to be the best fit for you. So I think it's really, really important to make sure that you do get a chance to kind of see these campuses for yourself as you're considering them. Yeah, absolutely. And just to kind of spin off your point there too, I think, um, something that I wish I did more of was see more campuses, right? Like I think the more you see, the more options you can, you know, what you like and, you know, you might like a bigger school rather than a smaller school. So I think it's important to really just cast a wide net and not sell yourself short and just get in, get on, on as many campuses as possible. Awesome. And uh, someone just wrote in as well, asking about the scholarship piece of it. Uh, there was some of the external scholarship opportunities. The two websites that we refer to were FastWeb and Niche, N-I-C-H-E. Um, again, you'll have access to this recording, so you'll be able to look at that later, but just wanted to call that out while we were on here too. Um, probably have time for one or two more questions at this point in time. So let's see what we have here that looks like there's a couple of repeats. We want to make sure that we provide uh, some good info here. Um, so how does early decision and the recruitment process work? I assume if you want to be recruited, that may not be a good option. So early decision, typically what I tell people, especially with the families that I work with, is you're typically only going to apply early decision to Kayla's point if it's the number one school and you'd be willing to do anything to get in there because it will increase your chances of being accepted by that school. 
or if you're in a position where you already have received a verbal offer from that particular program and the coach instructed you to apply early decision to maximize the potential of if they think that you're right on the line or if they think that's going to increase your chances for aid or for an acceptance in any way, shape, or form. So those are really the only decisions because it is a binding contract. That's really going to be the, the really the main reasonings as to why you would want to apply ED. Early action is going to be a situation where you're going to get an earlier response time, but it wouldn't necessarily be I automatically have to go to this school if I end up getting that acceptance. So you should only be applying to one school early decision. If you apply to more than one, you get accepted to both. You are in a bit of a situation there. So highly recommend only doing that if you are instructed to do so. And make sure you're reaching out to your guidance counselors and anyone you're working with to make sure that you are going about it the right way. All right. And let's see, is there anything else here that we can go into? All right, so someone also wrote in about potentially going to a campus tour. So how soon would you need to take an offer after doing a campus tour? Um, ultimately, it's not always a guarantee that you're going to receive an offer while you are on one of these tours if you're on an unofficial or an official visit. If you feel that it is going that way, more often than not, you can typically tell the coaching staff, look, I'm really happy to receive this offer. I'm super excited that you're interested in me, but I definitely need some time to think this over with my family. Do you have a deadline and when you would like a response for I've heard every side of that. I've heard coaches say, hey, take as much time as you need. We'll check in. Just make sure you kind of keep us posted if you are getting interest elsewhere. I've heard other coaches say, hey, we can give you a week, but just so you know, we have three spots left. Five people receive an offer. The first three who say yes are going to be who ends up getting uh, getting those spots. So it's really a very circumstantial type of situation, but just make sure that you are being upfront and open and honest about the time that you need. And they'll also kind of treat you with that same respect if it is something they need to hear on a little bit of a faster timeline. Um, but I think that is all the time that we have here, everyone. Again, we really appreciate everyone taking the time to learn a little bit more about this. Um, as we mentioned before, you will re automatically receive recording of this webinar at some point tomorrow, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and Kayla did throw in the chat if you are looking to sign up for any future webinars, particularly when we're going to be covering the NCAA settlement, uh, make sure you you check that out, and we'd love to see you there as well. Um, Kayla, any other parting thoughts before we wrap up here that you'd like to add? No, no. Um, hope everyone had a good time here tonight and just can take some information away from this as you guys are moving into this application process. We know it can be tedious, but we're just happy that we can provide this information to you guys to help make it a little bit easier. So awesome. Well, that's perfect. Again, thanks everyone so much for your time. We hope to see you again sometime soon. And uh, best of luck with your applications if you're starting those in the near future. Have a great rest of your night, everyone. Thanks again.